Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. I am Evelina Parisi from Aerofins Tecna SES department. Aerofins Tecna was founded 25 years ago and today is the competence centers for mycotoxins in Aerofins Technologies division. The today webinar will hold by our product manager, Julia Rosa. Please, Julia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evelina. And thank you to all the participants for uh, this connection this morning uh, and this afternoon for uh, the Asiatic um, attendees. I am very glad today to provide you this presentation on aflatoxin M1 screening solutions from Eurofins Technologies. Before we start, uh, I would like to let you know that you are all muted but I do encourage to type your questions uh, to my colleague uh, Evelina in the chat box. At the end of the presentation, I will be very glad to um, answer your, your questions. I will make today a short presentation, a short introduction on the main sources of aflatoxin contamination in milk, uh, having an overview over local jurisdictions, and I will present then I screen Aflam one milk ELISA kit, that is the world first AUEC international approved screening method for the quantitative research of aflatoxin M1 in milk and milk powder. Being, uh, you know, well aware of the routine challenges of laboratories, uh, I am very, very glad to present also an innovative automatic platform for ELISA implementation. That is, in my opinion, um, a very interesting option to standardize the performances, save time, and uh, for the time being also to maintain some social distancy uh, between people. And finally, I will conclude uh, providing with um, providing an overview over the available options from Eurofins technologies uh, for the analysis of aflatoxin M1 in different dairy matrices, covering also uh, different purposes. So let us start with uh, the metabolic production of aflatoxin M1. We all know, you know, that molds grow mainly over vegetal commodities under wet and hot conditions. Nevertheless, draft is uh, a source of stress for plants and uh, draft can lead to the reduction of their capability to defend themselves against fungi. So mycotoxins and especially aflatoxins production is boosted under dry and hot conditions. Uh, for instance, during uh, rainless hot summer seasons. Uh, aflatoxins are typically unfilled toxins that contaminate maize mainly among many other vegetal commodities like fruits, nuts and spices, other cereals and so on. But let me mention that aflatoxin growth can occur also on stock silages at the end of the storage time. Uh, let's say usually close to the novel harvesting season after uh, one year of storage in foxholes and siloses. When cows are fed with aflatoxin B1 contaminated mice, uh, they do metabolize the native substance into a more hydrophilic compound by inserting, uh, you can see here in the bottom of the slide, an oxidrile um, residue uh, in the molecule. And this more hydrophilic compound is named because aflatoxin M1 because of M, like milk. And indeed, it is excreted in milk with a carryover ratio that depends on many factors, so the health of the cow, the age, and so on, the concentration of contamination of feed. It was thought to be a ratio around 1%. Now it has been demonstrated that it ranges between 2 and 6%. 
Although the purpose of the metabolic path of cows is the de detoxification of nating with toxin, you all know that aflatoxin M1 is still classified as cancerogenic. And this is the reason why we have in place different jurisdictions and different regulation in the world. The world is actually divided into two main groups. On one hand, we have the European Union that established that the maximum aflatoxin concentration in milk at 0.05 micrograms per kilogram of milk. That means 50 nanogram per kilogram or 50 PPT. The limit is cut at 0 0.025 uh, micrograms per kilogram of milk for infant formulae and uh, dietary foods for infants uh, with uh, uh, special purposes or uh, special needs. The same levels were adopted by neighbor countries uh, these levels are very low, uh, some of the lowest that I have ever seen for chemical contaminants in food. Uh, this is because milk is intended uh, as a food for, indeed, for, for infants in general, and uh, our exposure to it is uh, pretty wide. Uh, neighbor countries sometimes have modified the limit over the time to match with their contingent, contingent contamination and to protect the domestic production. It was the case of Serbia in 2014, uh, where the dramatic outbreak of aflatoxins in cereals and aflatoxin M1 contamination in milk uh, led to a temporary modification of the limit up to 0 0.2 uh, micrograms per kilogram. So it was allowed to have a, a, four, a four times higher um, contamination. I have to mention that also some European countries during the outbreaks uh, in uh, 2012, for instance, demanded to the European Union to have temporary modifications of aflatoxin M1 limit in milk to prevent their production. They had no success. It was not allowed to have this temporary modification. Their request was based on the fact that for the rest of the world outside the European Union, the limit is as high as 0 0.5 micrograms per kilogram. The Food and Drug Administration limit is indeed 10 times higher than the one that is in place in Europe. And this level has been adopted by the US and Canada, Latin American countries, apart from Chile, China, and many of these yet other Asiatic countries, and most of the Arabic countries. So we have this split situation, split and different situation around the world. Let us enter in the very core of this presentation. Let me present now you ice cream Aflam One Milk Eliza Kit. This kit is the world first AUAC International Performance Tested Method for the quantitative research of aflatoxin M1 in milk and milk powder. The assay was actually developed around uh, 20 years ago here in our laboratories in Italy. <coughs> Sorry. We followed um, ISO <coughs> 14675 <coughs> prescriptions. Sorry. Let me take some water. Um, the kit was designed to um, analyze raw milk directly uh, after milking within 24 hours, but it can also be stabilized with preservatives and stored for delayed anal analysis. It is also possible to run the milk directly in the assay as it is with natural content of fat or process the sample with a centrifugation step to remove the fat as prescribed by the ISO guideline. 
The, eyes, uh, the assay is uh, 25 minutes long, consists of uh, three incubations. The first incubation is the binding reaction between the antibodies coupled on the solid phase and the M1 molecules in the standard R samples. <coughs> the second incubation is the competition of the enzyme conjugate for the same binding regions of the antibodies. And finally, in the third incubation, the colorless substrate that is added into the wells is converted into a blue product. The color intensity after a short development time is inversely proportional to the aflatoxin concentration of standard and samples. By adding the stop solution, the reaction is blocked and the color changes into yellow. Results are obtained by means of a reader equipped with a filter at 450 nanometers. Data can finally be calculated by means of the spreadsheet that is available for free at our website. We include everything that is needed for the analysis inside the kit, um, including uh, also seven standards that cover the range 0.005 to 0 0.25 micrograms per liter of milk. Why do you include seven standards? Because as I was mentioning earlier, the kit was projected since the beginning to match with the ISO guideline. These tables compare the list of requirements from the ISO guideline in terms of everything performances, sensitivity, selectivity of the assay, curve positioning, kit components, nature of the antibody, the conjugate, and so on, cross-reactivity to M2 with the ice cream Aflam 1 milk features. And you see that all the requirements are perfectly fulfilled. We are using polyclonal antibody, aflatoxin B1 conjugate, we can offer the 96 wells plate format and the other two options in terms of uh, size of the kit. The assay time is pretty lower than the limit. Internal specification of, um, the, the, let's say, the top and the mean value of the curve are perfectly in line with the requirements. Cross reactivity to M2 is lower than 20%. We are including seven standards that need to be run in duplicate. The calibration range is wider than what is requested by the ISO. Samples uh, also are to be run in duplicate and the sample dilution is permitted to match also with the FDA limit and also to uh, calculate the concentration for extraordinary high, um, co highly contaminated materials. Uh, we have different options for the curve uh, um, preparation, the repeatability of the standards um, is uh, lower than the ISO prescription and during the AUSC validation turned to be even lower. Uh, limit of detection and limit of quantification were uh, pretty much lower than what is requested as a limit in the ISO. The yeah, eyes request uh, for sample preparation for milk uh, to run the centrifugation and the defatting, and this is one of the options for raw milk. <coughs> and obviously, for milk powder, uh, the reconstitution with water is requested, and recovery is always higher than 80%. This is the AUSC certificate that was achieved earlier this summer by uh, my colleagues from the R&D. This certificate can be downloaded directly from the AUSC website. It includes a few pages with the product presentation, the validation discussion and results. And today now, I'm going to provide an overview of the validation protocol we followed and I'm showing the results that we obtained here in European Stecna Laboratories and those also that were confirmed by a third party entity 
that was an independent laboratory in the US named the QLab that we didn't know before this trial and that used the kids for the very first time during this study. So, as a first step, Eurofence technical researchers ran the calibration study. We were asked to demonstrate the repeat repeatability of curves. We ran six curves. They were obtained in different days by different operators using also two readers. The table here shows the inhibition values of each standard obtained for each of the six curves. We have the mean results. And what is extraordinary in my vision is the coefficient of variation and the standard deviation. Standard deviation and RSD coefficient of variation. Data show an excellent intermediate reproducibility. And indeed, you see in the image in the graph, here we have six overlaid curves. The shape of the curve is also very good with a long linear range uh, that is the key for having uh, accurate and precise results. There are no flat portions at the beginning or at the end of the curve that are typical uh, attempts to extend sometimes a measuring range that is naturally shorter. And this is just a way to confuse end users, uh, pretending that the kit is able to detect something that is not capable to do, or maybe it can detect, but uh, it cannot quantify with uh, um, reliability. The second task was pretty complicated. Uh, we were assigned by AUC for the AUC verification was the investigation of the method selectivity. It's complicated in the sense that it was um, a, a complex and detailed study. The question is, uh, is the kit fully specific to the detection of aflatoxin M1 only? What if other compounds are in the sample? Can we wait for any interference from them? Maybe some overestimation that are so typical um, for ELISA methods? So we started with the negative milk that was uh, firstly verified with the LCM SMS analysis and it was uh, controlled with ELISA and turned to be negative. We spiked the material with 100 nanograms per liter of aflatoxin M1 and one, uh, 100 uh, nanograms per liter of M2. 100 nanograms per liter means uh, 0 0.1 micrograms, so double times the European limit, a pretty high concentration. While the ELISA results for the M1 toxin was accurate, having 97% recovery, we weren't able to detect the M2, that is the closest uh, molecule to aflatoxin M1. Uh, and even, even if it is a relevant concentration, the assay was not touched by, by this event. The blank materials was then used for a spiking experiments where we uh, fortified 10,000 nanogram per liter of native aflatoxins, fumanizin, vomitoxin, ocrotoxin, xerolinone, sterigmatocystin. Um, the aim was to stress the method with very high concentration to confirm its specificity. And the assay indeed returned unmodified results. So the blank material was still detected as blank for aflatoxin M1. We had a minor detection of B1 and G1 that indeed are uh, pretty similar to aflatoxin M1 in terms of chemical structure, but the interference was less than 0.2%. So nothing at this very high level. The last experiment was the verification of M1 dosage in co-presence with native toxins. So we kept these 100 nanograms per liter of M1 spiked sample, and we mixed it with 10,000 nanograms per liter of native toxins. We created for this exercise a totally unrealistic environment. 
possibly <laughs> due to a hook effect because it's too much. A negative interference was found with aflatoxin M1 was mixed with the native aflatoxins only, no interference from the rest of the molecules. We reduced the concentration of B and G aflatoxins to similar concentration to M1. It is still an unrealistic situation because uh, it would mean that the um, metabolism of cow is not existing and the interference disappeared. So the conclusion was that there is no relevant interference to the dosage by any compound that realistically could be co-present in milk. And we never ever found any higher um, recovery uh, overestimation due to the presence of other compounds than aflatoxin M1. Entering now in the very heart of the study, the performances of the assay were assessed for milk, obviously. Samples were spiked at five different concentrations uh, along the whole measuring range and uh, were analyzed following four different procedures, as indeed, and the kit insert we mentioned that the milk can be analyzed as fresh uh, within 24 hours after milking or stabilized. And for both situations, it is possible to run it uh, as whole when, with natural content of mm, fat or defected by centrifugation. So we have four conditions, two readers, two technicians, um, five replicates of each material that was used, were used as uh, blinded coded. The tables you see here summarize the average results that we obtained for the four protocols. You see all the time, we were able to have very accurate results, always having compact um, data series uh, with a limited standard deviation. We are always guaranteeing uh, a higher recovery than 80%, you remember it was uh, the limit prescribed in the ISO guideline. And also, we can see that there are no important differences among the four protocols. So it doesn't matter whether you ran the analysis on fresh milk, on stabilized milk, on uh, defatted milk, or on whole milk. These were the analysis obtained by our hands. Let's say we are the developers and the producers, we know everything about this kit, but what about an independent user? The metric study was confirmed outside our laboratory in QLab and local American fresh milk samples were used to, to repeat the experiments following just two of the products uh, of the protocols available. And you see, that uh, despite the presence of the, uh, an ocean between us and them, very similar recoveries and excellent repeatability were found. To complete the metric study for milk, the limit of detection and limit of quantification were assessed uh, by using obviously a blank material. Once we uh, assessed the expected limit of quantification by calculating the mean response of blank materials plus 10 standard deviation, we wanted to confirm it by spiking uh, the blank materials at a close concentration. This is the table with uh, results we got for 10 replicates of blank materials run with the four conditions. Uh, the calculation here, you can see the mean value that we obtained following the four protocols, the standard deviation that was very compact. We calculated the limit of detection that is pretty similar among the four conditions and ranged between 3 and 3.7 nanograms per liter. And we were also calculated the expected limit of quantification. So we went for the confirmation by spiking at 5 ppt 
again, four different protocols. We spiked the, the blank materials and ran 10 replicates each. We um, found uh, this situation, all the determinations were detected by the assay as positive with consistent results. So we were able to successfully confirm that the limit of quantification can be um, set at five nanograms per liter. Results were confirmed by the QLab uh, in the US, always by means of uh, local fresh milk that in their hands gave uh, also even lower matrix effect. So in their hands, uh, the limit of detection turned to be even lower. We think it's safer to uh, consider three 3.5 nanograms per liter as a limit of detection and five uh, as a limit of quantification for all the protocols. The metric study was then run for the Padred milk. The samples were reconstituted with water and treated, treated like they were li liquid milk. So all the results here are reported for liquid milk. The limit of detection and limit of quantification were assessed similarly to fresh milk by confirming uh, the limit of quantification with a fortification experiment. We obtained absolutely very similar results uh, comparing, let's say, uh, these metrics uh, to uh, the results we uh, obtained for fresh uh, liquid milk. So it seems that the uh, the process of producing uh, milk powder does not affect the metrics uh, uh, in any man manner. This is uh, the mean value that we obtained for blank materials. So we calculated the limit of detection, turned to be pre slightly lower than two nanograms per liter. Limit of quantification at round five, we spiked at five and uh, we're able to obtain a consistent, accurate results uh, for the spiked materials. For meat powder, we had an advantage. We could assess uh, the accuracy and precision of the assay uh, by using reference and control materials that are available from different suppliers. Sorry. Here. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, we were able also to cover with these uh, um, uh, with these uh, materials uh, the whole measuring range of the assay. Again, we are expressing the concentration uh, in terms of reconstituted milk. So you see which were the expected values that were um, assayed by uh, reference methods, so uh, instrumental analysis. Then you see the mean results that we obtain, the standard deviation and the average recovery. We obtain a very good results here in European Stecna. And we were also able to compare with those uh, obtained by the QLab. We shared the two of the materials, the blank and the lowest contaminated. Plus they wanted to add one from uh, um, a test veritas company that is close to the European uh, regulatory limit. And uh, you see that uh, they were always able to obtain successfully um, good results, uh, very good recovery and uh, compact uh, data um, dispersion. To finalize, the AUSC verification. It was necessary to demonstrate the lot-to-lot -lot consistency and the stability of the kit. Questions are, are the kit batches equal one to each other? Otherwise, it could be possible for us to have this verification just on one perfect batch. And also, are the performances of the kit equal during the time? when it's freshly released by the production, at the middle of its shelf life and close to expiration. To reach the goal, we used the three different batches chosen at different ages. So freshly made, made 
half-life and close to expiration. We ran the curves uh, that always turn to be compliant and overlaid. Besides, um, a blank milk was used as negative and fortified together with a reference material, a powder milk, of course, reconstituted, with an assigned value close to the European limit. It is clear from the linear regression reported in the graph that the assay keeps its performances despite the batch number and the age. The statistic comparison also of data collected for samples led to the demonstration that all data sets were comparable one to each other. So with, uh, with this experiment, we successfully demonstrated the stability of the kit and lot-to-lot -lot consistency. <clears throat> the very last aspect is the assay robustness. How is the response of the assay when the protocol is changed or the environment is different? We know that the incubation time could sometimes vary, especially when the analyst is, I don't know, overloaded with tasks. As it's normal, for instance, to delay the preparation of the washing buffer, for instance, because you don't really realize that you um, have to uh, have it ready. The temperature in the laboratory could also vary because, you know, of the season or when the heating system of air conditioning uh, do not work properly and so on. So as a result, we agreed with the AUAC to apply um, factorial design to point out which of the differences introduced in the protocol that is here uh, in bold, you see the regular conditions that you should uh, follow. Um, and uh, we investigated uh, with this factorial design uh, which of these uh, modifications could lead to any performances deviation. So once more, we ran the calibration and uh, used um, a sample also, a powdered milk sample. We spiked that uh, a certain concentration and the sample was run in three replicates, not to have one data only. As a result, uh, the assay showed excellent results also when the incubation uh, time was modified. Well, let me tell you, all the data were compliant. Um, when the incubation time was modified, I have to say nothing really happened. Uh, results were uh, excellent in line with the validation. Very modest influence from um, the temperature was recorded. It, it is, uh, I have to say, really normal, considering the importance of the temperature of the, the kinetics of binding reaction. So this is normal. Still, um, the, the, the sessions were always compliant to specification. So this was the last experiment run within the AUSC approval. We were um really uh really satisfied that it is it is not a case uh that that, that this kit would um showed really excellent results uh on uh, raw milk despite the, the 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 preparation on milk powder and uh, we were glad to see the robustness of the assay uh, the consistency and the um, stability it is not the case in my vision that robustness is included in the verification protocol and it, it is so important to um, to have it and um, I have to say that despite the excellent robustness of ice cream offline when milk environment conditions could really affect the results of any immunoassay uh, at the same time uh, busy times, uh, overloading days uh, could also boost human mistakes other than those that we analyzed here. So, um, 
let me also reflect now uh, on the urgent need to guarantee now on the workplace uh, a proper distance between people. Um, I am aware that this is fairly not easy to obtain and could lead also to further consequence on those uh, running experiments if they are really overloaded with uh, experiments. Why am I mentioning these points? because we wanted to answer a question is there anything we can do to support routine analysis of laboratories and industries to standardize the assay execution and consequently the performances is there any way to free the analyst despite the quality of this very kit is there anything that we can offer to 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 support the routine of laboratories of industries and so on so, thanks to the European Technologies Network of companies we now belong to, uh, we are very glad to offer the analysts with different ELISA robots uh, that are different because of their uh, customizable throughput. They are characterized by excellent pipetting accuracy. They have integrated functions to carry the whole ELISA implementation without any external intervention intervention there is no need to take the kit wash outside or read in another reader eliza automated solution obviously are not an original invention but compared to uh, certain huge machines that were conceived at the beginning for clinical diagnostics and huge throughputs I do believe that this very option that I'm here representing in this slide will meet the realistic needs of food laboratories. The Bolt is the most compact, easy to use and flexible ELISA robot. It hosts one plate, but multiple protocols could be run in parallel in the same frame if kids uh, do share the same uh, type of plate. It can be, be therefore adopted also for low and medium analytical volumes. In the past, let me mention that it, it was not reasonable. Um, this is not a machine that has a meaning only for huge consumes. Which are the, the, the remaining, the other uh, advantages? Being a closed system, it ensures a protected environment and guarantees this guarantee is obviously excellent assay reproducibility over the time. It doesn't matter who is the person that loads the standards and samples in the racks. It doesn't matter if it's winter or, or summer. Everything is uh, perfectly standardized. The Bolt uh, belongs to European Technologies, which is the key point here that it hosts many validated methods for different contaminants. Uh, not just aflatoxin M1, uh, there are methods for native toxins uh, in cereals, phycotoxins in water, pesticides like the glyphosate, residues of antibiotics and allergens. Also, there is the possibility to run the gluten ELISA test kit that is also AUC approved and it is based on the R5 codex approved antibody. It is important to mention that the methods are already been validated because uh, sometimes I know that um, these machines are attractive to laboratories, but then everything must be handled by the analyst. And before uh, earning the advantage of having the automation in the lab, it is uh, really a huge way uh, having the training from the producer of the robot, then trying to uh, have a program that runs the kit and then you need to adjust the drift effect that usually happens with robots. Uh, you have to manage uh, cross-contamination events uh, and to adjust the, the, the performances in general. Everything is already done so it's a, a reliable solution that immediately brings an advantage to um, the routine. Going back to aflatoxin M1 in milk. The advantage of using the Bolt for M1 analysis in milk is dramatic. 
think that it is possible to analyze the milk samples without running any sample preparation. So it means that the, and the, 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 the person, the analyst, is really free. Once the materials are dropped into tubes and inserted in the robot racks, the analysis could be hands run potentially by anyone with almost no training. And considering our current situation, uh, this instrument uh, uh, looks to me as a real improvement to routine analysis with plenty of advantages. So it's robust, compact, helps in performance standardization. It comes with already validation methods that just need to be transferred from our laboratory to yours and supports the distance in laboratory and free the people to do something else with, uh, in the end, a very reasonable investment. We are reaching the end of the presentation. I just want to mention which, which are the options you have from Eurofins Technologies uh, for the analysis of aflatoxin M1 and different dairy products uh, and what you can choose to adapt to your real uh, analytical throughputs. So this is the guy we uh, widely discussed today about, uh, ice cream Afla M1 milk. It's available in three formats, 48, 96, 192 determination. It means half plate, one plate, and two plates kit. That's interesting because it is possible to arrange um, a contract with us where you can receive uh, um, a smaller format in low season and uh, before, after harvesting, so when usually analysis, uh, analysis uh, um, increase, uh, you can ask for the big format that uh, helps you in saving money. Also, you can ask for the milk diluent. If you want to shift the measuring range, uh, to adapt, to, to be compliant to the FDA uh, requirement. And also, if you are uh, in the need of diluting uh, uh, highly concentrated materials, you can have it. It's very cost efficient. If you want to run some spot application to cheese, then you can ask for the extraction buffers. Again, they are very uh, cheap uh, products. Uh, we can also release you the application notes. So they are not AOAC approved, but uh, you can run uh, successfully on the kit. Also, uh, there are two supplementary standards uh, that, are, uh, that have been uh, uh, conceived and released to boost the accuracy and precision around the European uh, limit. So if you want to be very, very sure and confident about your quantification around the European legislation, you can use, you can add these two standards. And of course, we provide you also with the dedicated spreadsheet. The kit is ISA compliant, is a UAC approved for milk and milk powder, and the bolt application will be finalized this very month, so you will soon receive the information after our application launch. Should you uh, have more cheese materials to analyze, then I would recommend to have uh, the all-in-one kit, the ice cream Aflam one is the same kit, same reagent, same um, antibody, conjugate, assay time, everything is the same uh, than the milk version. It does not have the USC approval just for, uh, I mean, it was a choice since the beginning, but for milk, it works exactly the same as uh, the, the milk version, but it, it includes in the same box, the extraction buffer, and the instruction to run the pasteurized milk, cheese and firm cheese with dedicated procedures, yogurt. We are releasing now the mozzarella cheese and soon we will have other applications. And as for the milk version, we are launching this very month, the Bolt uh, application. What if uh, the analytical volume of your laboratory, of your industry is, is low. 
the expense of running seven standards in duplicate, you know, could be uh, really uh, dramatic, uh, really important when you have in your routing a few samples to run per sessions and milk is not easy to, to store for a long time. So you can see from the graph here, if you have three samples to be run per session, with a regular ice cream, you have to spend 14 wells for the calibration and six wells for your samples. It means 20 wells, uh, pretty a quarter, uh, pretty, um, around a quarter of the kit, just for three samples. The B0 is a master curve calibrated assay. It is specifically designed for low analytical volumes. And it includes just one standard, the zero one, the uncontaminated, let's say the blank. You have it to run, uh, you have to run it uh, in one replicate only. Plus you have to use one well for each of the materials of the samples you, you want to run. So if you compare these volumes here, you are running 20 wells and here just four. The saving is dramatic. Still, the measuring is, is quantity, the assay is quantitative. Uh, this is the measuring range, goes uh, from 0 0.01 up to 0 0.2 micrograms per kilogram of aflatoxin 1 in milk. Uh, it is slightly less sensitive, but sufficiently sensitive for the European market. And there is another advantage that is the assay time, because this kit takes just uh, 30 minutes. The, I was mentioning that the measure is still quantitative. How is that possible? Thanks to the robustness of the assay and the condition of the, uh, of the reaction, we were capable to remove the standards from the kit as, I mean, um, real standards, uh, real bottles that you have to run. And we provide the master curve as virtual in the kit um, certificate. So uh, you can use that virtual curve that is assessed by us uh, at the moment of the production for the calculation of your data. <coughs> and I think it's really an advantage uh, when, uh, when you have to handle uh, a limited number of samples per, per time. The bolt application is already available. So you can have also the B0 FLM1 run in the say in the in the bolt. Uh, I want to take a moment to present my team. Uh, these are the uh, ladies uh, that we have in our in our laboratory, our R and D competence center in Italy. The company has, as Evelina was uh, mentioning, uh, more than twenty five years uh, of experience. Um, our science orientation is, is strong thanks to, not to us just, but to the partnerships that we successfully had over the time with laboratories, uh, many public institutes and also dairy factories that uh, cooperates, uh, co or cooperated with us and supported us and permitted us to learn what is uh, the real need of a routine laboratory. And this led to our reference in the dairy sector. But also, it's not just a matter of Tecna. Now we are a part of a multinational network. So we are achieving a very strong support from Eurofins Laboratories and Eurofins Technologies Network of partners, just thinking to um, the Bolt that is uh, available from one of our uh, partner inside Eurofins Technologies. Mm, uh, this is a consistent advantage in my vision uh, to, to have us as a partner for your routing analysis. So thank you, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I don't know if there are any answers before, uh, any questions, sorry, <laughs> I hope so. Before we start, I would like to leave you my personal email address for any 
curiosity you may have in the future and also the shared mailbox that uh, is covered by my colleagues uh, Valeria and Giulia uh, that are glad to provide you any technical assistant uh, will respond to your questions uh, before when using the kit and also after for any doubt you may have. Also, I invite you to visit our YouTube uh, channel because there is a um, video dedicated to the M1 um, kit so you can learn how it works, uh, which are the steps and, uh, and that's it. Um, Evelyn, I don't know if you uh, uh, have collected any, any questions. Yeah, thank you, Julia, for the clear and very detailed presentation of this morning. And yes, we had some questions from the audience. So the first okay. one, ready? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Which is the sample treatment for pasteurized milk? Um, pasteurized milk is, uh, can be analyzed uh, directly in the assay uh, without uh, any manipulation. So you just uh, bring the, the, the milk and run in the assay or eventually, if you do prefer, you can centrifuge. It's like the mm, raw milk, let's say. Okay, thanks. So always remaining on the simple preparation, which is the difference between cheese and firm cheese? Ah, <laughs> um, cheese are extracted in solvent using uh, the chloromethane. Uh, then you have to run, of course, the evaporation of the solvent. Uh, you uh, need to reconstitute with buffer, and then you have to uh, defat with axon. For firm cheese, uh, that is. Um, you know, like uh, our, in our in, in Italy, we have met plenty of them, uh, grana padano, parmigiano, and so on, seasoned cheese. Uh, we added uh, a digestive step with pepsin. So these are the differences. Uh, everything is included in the kit insert of ice cream, a flam one. Okay, thank you. Ice cream, half lime one milk is the only AOSC approved for ELISA method at the moment? Uh, yes, it's the only one uh, that uh, is approved AOSC. Yeah, for milk, raw milk, and, and milk powder. The software for in the, the interpretation of the results is available. Yes, you can download directly from our website at the bottom of the product page. It's um, an Excel spreadsheet. It's for free. You type uh, um, the absorbances you collect from your reader, uh, from the calibration and for the samples, and you easily calculate the concentration. The spreadsheet for the milk version includes just uh, the application to uh, milk and milk powder. On the one for uh, for cheese, the M1, let's say, comprehensive version includes also um, the columns for calculating uh, the um, the results for cheese, yogurts uh, that uh, have different uh, um, uh, uh, dilution factors. Let me tell you, Evelina, that it is possible to use uh, any software uh, included in each of the ELISA readers. Usually it's uh, very easy to, to program, but of course uh, also this copy and paste inside our spreadsheet is recommended and is dramatically easy. Thank you, Julia. Why didn't you compare the same results on milk with the LCMS? Sorry, I didn't understand. Why didn't you compare the same results on milk with LCMS? Uh, because, uh, well, we agreed, we had a long discussion uh, with AUSC about how to run um, the validation on milk. Our question mark was how to handle 
this matrix that is not stable, like, I don't know, cereals or other uh, vegetal dried commodities that, that uh, can be stored and uh, uh, reanalyzed and so on. So we decided to have the comparison of the performances to LCMSMS um, when using the milk powder, the reference materials. Um, for the rest, uh, we agreed just to run the spiking, uh, um, the, the, the spiking uh, experiments uh, um, on, on raw milk uh, um, for, for AUSC. Let me comment that, of course, this uh, what I presented today belongs to the AUSC approval path and is the discussion, let's say, the presentation of the data that are attached to the AUSC um, approval. Uh, and certificate, but uh, in the past, um, also by the precious collaboration with uh, plenty of, of uh, laboratories and uh, dairy industries, we made a lot of these comparisons, um, verifying the, the correlation of our results to uh, LCMS or HPLC analysis uh, uh, for aflatoxin M1. It was actually the core of our validation that we had in the past. We can still we still have the, the those data. Some of them have been published also in some uh, um, conferences and posters. So we did it in the past. For this very study, we decided not to do so. Perfect, thanks. Since we are running out of time, I will read you one last question, and yep. then I will strongly encourage uh, for further questions to write to the address that you can see on these slides. For Thailand, most customers like to use rapid tests. So what should be the benefits of ice cream over those rapid tests and which may also have AOSC? Uh, there is a huge difference between the ice cream and the rapid test in many sense, I have to say that uh, if rapid tests are used for, um, I don't know, good acceptance or on-field analysis, uh, they are really, they cannot be, um, uh, how can I say, uh, replaced by the eye screen. I see maybe the B0 ELISA more suitable because it allows uh, to get the results in 30 minutes. But of course, the ice cream uh, do really have um, excellent uh, performances. So uh, the difference are in terms of uh, accuracy, precision, uh, sensitivity usually. So uh, I think they fit for different purposes. Um, in some of the practice that uh, that I, I know about, uh, um, the two techniques uh, can uh, uh, live together and uh, um, you can be used for different purposes. So first, maybe I use rapid tests. I mean, lateral flow devices, uh, immunochromatographic assays uh, for fast um, semi-quantitative uh, analysis, and then. Um, I use uh, the ELISA for, for um, let's say, uh, further analysis. Also, uh, uh, let me comment that the, the throughput of the analysis is different. So uh, it's pretty hard to imagine to me that you can handle uh, efficiently dozens of samples in parallel with strip tests. So also what I could imagine is that you can use the strip test for the analysis of, I don't know, mass commingled milk when you receive, a, I don't know, a tank or a track. But um, when when you really want to, to learn something more about the farms, so the, the, the different producers or the different samples that uh, were mixed together in that uh, tank of commingled materials, you have to use uh, the ELISA. Uh, if you think, that in a little more than one hour, you get the results up to 40, I don't know, samples uh, for one plate. That is uh, 
uh, less than two minutes uh, per per, sam per per sample. Let's say if you if you think to run one after each other. <coughs> so I think that the two techniques uh, cannot be interchanged, but there are some points uh, for a fruitful discussion in my vision. Yes, of course. Thank you. So Julia, to answer this also this session of uh, questions, since the time is almost over. Uh, we strongly um, encourage you to write to Julia and to our colleagues of support and technical assistance. And please also visit our website and our YouTube channel in which you can find a small video regarding the products. Thank you to all for your time and for your attention today. And we wish you all a very nice day. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Evelina, for your support. Uh, and uh, once more, feel free to contact us for any, um, any uh, requests or curiosity you may have. Bye-bye. Goodbye.